Hallelujah, hallelujah. I've come to encourage somebody this morning. Genesis chapter number 18. God is telling Abraham and his wife Sarah again that they will have a child. They are old in age. In fact, the Bible doesn't just say they're stricken in years. It says they're well stricken in years. They were well past senior citizen age. No kids. The door's been closed on that situation. But God comes back and tells them again, you will have a child. Sarah laughs. She not necessarily mocking God, but laughing at the absurdity of the promise. And the Bible says, the Lord says, wherefore, or why did Sarah laugh in verse 13, saying, shall I of a surety have a child when I'm old, or which am old? And God says, is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Amen. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter number 32 and verse number 17, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heaven and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. And there is nothing too hard for you. Yes. When you think about the grandeur of the universe, any other space nerds in here? Anybody go down a figurative black hole of YouTube looking at black holes and scales of the universe and the amazing things. Yes, okay, there's a few of us here this morning. But the brilliance of the universe is absolutely astounding and truly beyond comprehension. The way that it is balanced, even though it appears to be chaotic, the way that the amount of protons and neutrons are literally out of the Billions of trillions, scientists say, are at a perfect one-to-one -one ratio. If the universe was expanding any quicker than it was, it would collapse. If it was expanding any slower than it was, it would explode. If there was any difference in degree of mass and the laws of gravity, there are. it is so fine-tuned. And we're not talking about one to the tenth power. We're talking about one to the tenth to the hundredth power. This is what our God has done. This is what your God has designed and created. The brilliance of the ecosystem of the earth. The brilliance of the human body and the human mind, which we literally do not understand. You are a self-running organic machine that heals itself and thinks for itself and makes decisions for itself and you feel and you you love and you and you hate and you fear and you you have confusion and you have confidence and you are such a complex human being god made that God is so far above and beyond our comprehension that we don't understand him. He said, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways above your ways and my thoughts above your thoughts. He's a brilliant God. He's an all-powerful God. There's nothing that he can't do. There's nothing that he can't overcome. I want you to think about this. Scientists say that there is only a 1% difference in our DNA between human beings and apes. Now, now think about that. 
God made one twitch on the DNA, the genome, whatever you call that thing. One percent difference is the difference between living in the jungle and eating ticks off each other's heads and backs and going to the moon. So here's my question. What's the difference between us and the God that made all of that? God can do anything. Is there anybody here that believes there's nothing too hard for God? There's nothing too hard for him. And if God would permit me the liberty, I know what the scripture says, but I would dare say there's nothing that's even hard for God. He speaks and he blows the universe into existence. There's nothing hard for him. The Bible tells us again in Luke, when the angel comes to Mary and says, you're going to have a child and there's not going to be a physical father. She's having a hard time believing. And so the angel goes back and talks about her cousin Elizabeth and says, your cousin who is old in age, by the way, she's already six months pregnant. God already gave her a son. And then says again, is anything too hard for God? For with God, nothing is impossible. There it is right there in the word. Nothing's impossible for God. What is your situation today? What is it that you think is too hard for him? There's no physical healing that's hard for him. There's no financial provision that's hard for him. There's nobody that cannot be saved. There's nobody that cannot be restored. There's no prodigal that cannot come home. There is nobody... He can do anything. Come on, I need somebody to believe that this morning. God can do anything. That's the easy part. Church, Brother Tony's back there. He came up for prayer. Is God going to heal him? We believe that. We have faith for that. But if I asked you if God's going to do it for you, we don't believe that. Oh, we believe he can. We just don't believe he will. Faith is what bridges the gap from a figment in our mind of what's possible and takes us to the reality of it will happen. See, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, faith is what? The substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Right? But then it also says in verse 6, that he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God is not like Santa Claus. God is not just a now I lay me down to sleep God. 
He, it's not just, okay, I believe God is, and well, I hope I walk into a miracle. I hope it just happens to me. I hope God just walks down my pew and takes care of all my problems. There has to be a conviction inside of us that goes from hearing the word of God and just saying in our mind it's true to our alignment responding to the fact that if I believe this, I'm going to do something about it. See, I say this kindly, but there were people that had physical needs in their bodies that stayed in their pews. Why? Because they are either afraid or they don't believe. They don't believe it's going to happen for them. Now, there's no shame in that. It just means you need some faith. But when you respond and say, you know what, they're calling for prayer to heal the sick. And I don't know if God's going to do it, but I'm going up anyway. Right. Yep. I'm responding to the call. I'm going to go from thinking about it to walking into it. Yeah. That's the difference. Yep. I don't just believe that there's a God. Or that there's possibly a God. Even an agnostic says, well, maybe there's a God out there, but he's just unknowable and he's unsearchable. But no, faith says, you know what? If there's a God in heaven, I'm going to diligently seek after. I'm going to pursue this. I'm going to find out if this is real. The human nature does this. God, show yourself to be God and I will believe. Provide for me, and I will do. And God says, you got it backwards, baby. <laughs> you believe, and I'll show you I'm God. Yeah. Oh. oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Hey, if you want me to do a miracle, then you lift your hands up and you seek my face. Right. If you want your oh if you want your finances blessed, you return the tithe first. When you're getting into financial strapping, you don't cut out the tithe so you can pay the bills. Oh, I know I'm only supposed to say that kind of stuff on Wednesday. You don't cut the tithe. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> Have you lost your mind? You say, but I can't afford to tithe. No, you can't afford not to tithe. He said, hey. You return the tithe, and watch what I'll do. I'll pour out windows. I'll pour it out of the windows of heaven. Press down, shaken together, running over. But you got you to gotta cut that check first. And I'm here to tell you, personally speaking, that if you give in your... I don't even know why I'm talking about finances. But if you give to the kingdom of God... If you give of what God has given you, see, tithe is not giving. Tithe is returning. God says, I've given you all of this. The earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. Let nobody think that they've got their own stuff. God can take it in a moment. He says, hey, you return the tithe. You bring your tithes back to me, and then you bring the offering on top of that. And you watch, see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you can't contain. And I'm here to tell you, we're not a prosperity. You never heard the prosperity doctrine from this church, have you? I'm not preaching name it and claim it, give it, and it shall be given ten times. Oh, I'm feeling a seed offering right now. If somebody write a check, God's going to have a check in the mail for you ten times. Oh, y'all had seen that before. 
And I'm going to tell you something. God will bless your finances and provide every need for you. He'll bless your kids. Your kids will get blessings that they, don't, they didn't work for. They'll get vineyards they didn't plant and houses they didn't build. Because God put it in his word. He said, if you do this, I'll take care of your kids. I'm here to tell you, I'm in a job. I don't even know how I got here. I'm not, I'm saying this humbly. I'm making money I have no business making. I have two years, no degree of an unaccredited Bible college. Because God doesn't need a degree. God doesn't need the stuff you think he needs. He'll pull the coin out of a fish's mouth and say, here you go. But it was because I was faithful. It's because I gave and we never stopped. Even when things were tight, we always gave that tithe and returned it to the Lord. It's because my in-laws gave to the Lord. It's because my mother gave to the Lord. And that is a promise of the word of God. Okay, that part's over. Lord knows why that was just talked about. Because I did not plan on going there, brother. <laughs> the Lord knows. Amen. We act first. Right. Look at almost every occurrence in the word of God. God, I can't find it. I can't find it where God just steps out and says, you know what, I'm just going to do this. Every time he partners with man and says, okay, I'm going to do this, but first you're going to do this. Moses, you're at the Red Sea. Lift the rod. Moses, reach into your cloak and pull it out. Put it back in. Pull it out. See what happens. Put your rod down, then pick it back up. I mean, he's talking to a burning bush. He's either talking to God or he has literally lost his mind. But he's still obeying. He's still acting on what he's heard. I'm going to give you the battle, Israel. I know you're outnumbered 100 to 1, but you go out to battle anyways. You go out and face the enemy anyways. That's the real point of decision on if we believe God or not. When all looks stacked against us, and there's a whole bunch of people in here today, that it looks like everything is stacked against you. It looks like your kids are never going to be saved. It looks like your finances are never going to come into order. You're never going to be healed. You're never going to receive the promise. That ministry is never going to happen. Sound familiar to anybody? Like, yeah, that sounds like myself talking to myself. God says... Believe me. Believe that I am who I say I am. Believe I will do what I said I would do. But obedience is the threshold to fulfilling the promise. See, that's the part we don't like. Because when we take a step of faith, oh no, we don't see what's going to happen. What's over here? We're trusting that God knows what's on the other side of that. And we're deciding, am I going to trust myself? Or am I going to trust God? Am I going to trust this? Or am I going to trust this? See, that's the battle we wrestle with all the time. My way or God's way. His word or the word of society, or the word of my family, or the word of my past, or the word of my mind. And God says, if you will trust me and do what I've asked you to do, I will show myself to be God in your life. Amen. Amen. Obedience is the threshold to fulfillment. Every time. And the reason why so many of us are so frustrated. Why isn't this happening? 
why is God not blessing me? Just because it hasn't happened right now doesn't mean it's not going to happen. You don't give up in winter because it's not spring yet. And spiritually, I'm afraid that's what too many people do. Well, let's talk about our culture for a moment, shall we? Pop it in the microwave. Pop it in the air fryer. Put it in the Instapot. Go through the drive through Throw 500 bucks in Dogecoin, and then it'll... Anybody know about Dogecoin? No? Let me just put a bunch of money in this, and boom, I'll be rich. Young people today want to come out of college making 150 grand a year. Let me tell you something. My first job, I made $6 an hour at Sears. Minimum wage. That was back in 2003. $6 an hour. And people could... Oh... And we got young people and young adults just quit their job because, well, I don't like my job and I'm not making enough money. And guess what? You got to stick some things out before you see the fulfillment of where you want to go. And it's the same thing spiritually. You don't arrive overnight. You got to pray. You got to fast. You got to be faithful. Oh, God, but I prayed yesterday, and it didn't happen this morning. Well, I guess I'm done. You're laughing because you've done it. Yeah, I see all those smiles. The ones that aren't smiling are like, oh, man, he's right. Church, we've got to pray. We've got to fast. We've got to get into the word. Why? Not so we can get what we want and twist God's arm for those prayer requests, but so that we can align ourselves with God so that he can then fulfill the promise and the provision. That's it. Take a look at some of these, some of these scriptures. Ephesians 3, verse 20. You know it well. This is so often quoted in Christianity. Now unto him that is able. He is able. We all agree he's able to do exceeding, abundantly, above. That's Paul. He says everything in threes. He's not satisfied to show you how great God is. He's going to triple emphasize it so you know. He can do exceeding, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. Well, thank you, Jesus. I'm thinking about a six-figure job and a Lambo and some new clothes and every, all my problems to just disappear and my relationships to just be healed and me to get all over my addictions and to come out of my past and, oh, oh God, that's... Church, even in the apostolic church, sometimes we do try to name it and claim it. Well, I came up to the altar. Why didn't it just happen for me? According to the power that works in us. How much he's doing exceeding abundant above is according to how much he's working in you. Say that again, bro. The word. <laughs> Not shouting so much right now. What happened to my what happened to my preachers? Watch this in Philippians 2, verse 13. For it is God. Now he's writing to the church. He's writing to people who have been born again. They have received the new birth experience. And I'm glad to say. 
If you're in here and you haven't been born again, you can be born again. There's nobody that God cannot save. There's no sin that God cannot forgive. There's no past that he can't make clean. There's no shame that he can't turn into praise and glory. There's nothing that the blood of Jesus cannot restore and heal and forgive. All you've got to do is repent of your sins and say, God, it's not just I'm sorry. It's a turnaround. God, I'm done with this. Anybody sick of themselves? You know, that's when I came back to God is when I realized how sick of myself I was. When I realized all my problems were not everybody else and I realized the person that I really hated was the person in the mirror. Oh, I feel like I feel Michael Jackson right now. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. You want to know something? That song is true. That's where we need to start. It's not mommy. It's not daddy. It's not grandma. It's not pastor. It's not schoolmate. It's you. You made the choices you made. You dug yourself the hole you're in. But I got good news for you. You don't have to stay there. Because you can't save yourself anyway. So you turn around and say, God, I'm done with this. I'm sick of myself. I'm sick of this waffling. I'm sick of my double-minded ways. I'm turning to you. Forgive me of all my sins. And then he says, you can go down in the water in the name of Jesus. And every sin you ever committed can be remitted. It can be gone off the record in the name of Jesus. And then it doesn't end there. Because when you go down in the water, he puts a name on you. He says you go down, you come up in the family, the family, and you're named by the name of which the whole family in heaven and earth is named. The name of Jesus is on you. And he promises to fill you with his spirit. The spirit of that almighty God, the spirit of the God of which nothing is impossible will dwell inside of you and give you power to overcome sin and give you power to fellowship with God and to know him in a way that your spirit is literally intertwined with his. You are spiritually married to God. That's what the word says. What don't you know? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, I believe it is, that he says when a, when, a, when a man and woman is joined together, they become one flesh. But then he twists and he turns it and he says, everyone that has been filled with the Spirit or joined to the Spirit is one spirit with him. An intimacy and a relationship that really will give you everything you've been looking for in this life all along. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So that this is to those people that have been born again. It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of all the things you ask him to do. <laughs> no, that wasn't it. <clears throat> to will and to do of all your prayer requests. Nope. That wasn't it either. Of his good pleasure. When we allow God to work in us, he literally transforms us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ, to the point that we are being glorified, we're being saved as we go through this life and we will eventually be glorified the way Jesus is glorified. And we come into alignment with the will of God. Amen. And the things that we used to want, we don't want them anymore. Not because we're, we're, we're being controlled like a robot, but because he's literally opening our eyes and realizing most of the stuff we've been wanting is false advertising. And a lot of the stuff we keep desiring is the stuff that's killing us and keeping us in chains. 
and he opens up our eyes and says, you thought you wanted that, but now you see you don't want that. What you really want is this. You thought this was going to give you life, but now you see that I give you life. You wanted to feed yourself with everything else of this world, but now you see that this is the bread of life, and my spirit is the water of life. And he works and wills in us for his good pleasure. And when we do that, every single promise is for us. It's for us. His protection, his provision, his goodness, his favor, his mercy. Thankfully, God is merciful even when we don't deserve it. You want to know why? That's why it's called mercy. That's why it's called grace. He opens a door and says, come on in. I'm imploring for us, all of us as a church. None of us have arrived. I don't care how long you've been sitting on the pew. That pew might even have your imprint on it. I didn't mean that the way, well. <laughs> Whatever. Can I tell you something? It don't mean a thing. Doesn't matter how long you've been coming to church. It only matters if you are the church. God ain't lining the rapture up for Sunday at 10 a.m. A lot of us are hoping he is. It doesn't matter. But every one of us can have the power of God working his will and his goodness in us. Because he is no respecter of per persons. None. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter what your family name is. It makes no difference. God will do what he promised to do in your life. Amen. The call continues to go out today. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, beautiful portion. 2 Timothy, sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 2. This must have been a saying that the church used to used to say or or quote to each other because he, Paul says here in verse 11 it's a faithful saying I want you to notice the if and then here the if and then if we be dead with him we shall also live with him if we suffer we shall also reign with him if we deny him, he will also deny us. But look, look at this. If we believe not, yet he remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. See, part of the reason why we struggle so much with God is because we think God's like us. We're up one day and down the next. But God's always up. Some days we're strong and some days we're weak, but God's always strong. Some days we're good and some days we're not so good, but God's always good. Some days we have love and some days we have hate, but God is love. Some days we're faithful and some days we're not faithful, but the Bible says he's always faithful. He is always faithful to you. No matter what. Why? Because he can't deny himself. That's who he is. But here's the key. It says he can't deny himself. So yeah, he's, he's faithful to us. But according to what? According to who he is and according to his word. He is faithful to his word. He says repeatedly in the scripture, I have said it. Will I not also perform it? I've declared it. Won't it also come to pass? 
He's faithful to his word. So if we will come under the covering of his word, if we'll submit to his word, we hate that word so much. I was praying back there before service, and the Lord just began to allow me to, I don't know, see and or think thoughts going through my mind. We think about other cultures. Think about what's happening in the Middle East. Think about what's happening in China. Many provinces of Asia, Africa, where Christians are literally losing their lives. Losing their lives for the gospel. By gruesome ways. That stuff doesn't make the news here. But when we hear about it, it's enough to make you shudder with fear and trepidation of what they're going through. But do you know that the churches that are there say they have the greatest glory, the greatest peace, when persecution is rampant? Why? Because God will always provide his church for what they need. There are people in here, you're afraid of persecution. You see what's happening in the world. You see what's happening in our, the streets of our cities. And you can see what's coming. When are they going to start dragging us out of these buildings? When are they going to start beating us? When are they going to start jamming our parking lots? I'm in the Holy Ghost right now. Some of you are afraid. And you're afraid because you're in the flesh. Because you cannot make that decision in the flesh. You can only make it in the spirit. But this is the powerful news. If we will get in the spirit of God, that's what Elder Manley was preaching about on Wednesday night. If we'll get in the Holy Ghost, God will dispense grace upon you. So you have boldness. That you are not afraid. You look at Stephen in the book of Acts and say, how could a man who is being stoned stand up with boldness and preach the word of God while they're stoning him? His face shining like the sun. Why? Because God dispensed upon him what he needed in that hour. You may be afraid now, but I prophesy in the name of Jesus, you will not be afraid when you need to make a stand. But those same pastors have said, the complacency we have in this country and the richness we have in this country. See, in this country, every man's a king and every woman's a queen. We do whatever we want to. I know, I'm I'm only supposed to be talking like this on Wednesdays. Am I all right? We're kings of our own castles. We do whatever we want to. We, we go wherever we want to. We say whatever we want to. Don't make the mistake of thinking that God is going to conform to your kingdom. It will not happen. I don't care what the evangelical world is saying. I don't care what they're teaching and preaching. This is what the word of God says. We don't just go to God and say, bless my business and bless my ambitions and bless what I want to do and bless. No, it says the spirit works in us for his will and his purpose. And if we'll align ourselves with that. And for some of us right now, this sounds awful. This sounds absolutely terrible. But the people that walk with God are like, you don't understand. This is your best life. This is real life. I don't care what Joel Osteen wrote, your best life now. Your best life is in the spirit of God, aligned with the will of God and the word of God. God is asking us this morning, all of us, it doesn't matter where you're at, makes no difference because God's always got another threshold. 
There's always another threshold. And the worst thing about being in the kingdom of God for a long time, or worse yet, growing up in it, second and third generationers, you just think that the cross is always just there for you in the background. I'll get to it when I want to. No. We cross one threshold, and then we go like this. Oh, I think I'll just sit here the rest of my life. I'll just do this, and God goes, you don't understand. I'm trying to grow you. I'm trying to make you grow in me, make you be productive. See, in the kingdom of God, if you're not growing, you're dying. A tree doesn't just stay where it's always been. It either grows or it dies. Oh, my. I am so sorry for not being sorry. This is where God wants to lead us to. Out of the flesh, let scales fall from our eyes. Let us see with the eyes that God wants us to see with. You know what it's like? Anybody ever see The Matrix? Seriously, raise your hand if you've seen The Matrix. You ever seen it? Oh, come. <laughs> the Matrix is such a reality of what's going on in the spirit. People walking around in a, in a if, you don't, if you don't know the movie, it's basically where the world has been taken over by machines. And they're being used by machines to, to harvest their energy for themselves. But they have uh, tapped into the human brain and made them think that they're living a normal life, walking the streets. They're living lives. They're making money. They're doing this or that. And really, they're sitting in a vat of goo being used for an ulterior purpose. And then people break out of the matrix and realize this is not real life. You want to know something? That's exactly what the spiritual reality is. Walking around thinking I'm building an empire that ain't going with you to the grave, honey. Walking around wearing clothes that are going to be out of style in just a year or two. Walking around with a relationship that you think is always going to be there. No, it's not. Trying to impress people that don't matter. Building kingdoms that are going to turn to dust. And God's trying to open up our eyes and say, don't you understand? There's a glory coming. There's a glory of heaven that I'm trying to bring you to. There's a love that I'm trying to give to you. There's a life that I'm trying to give to you. Stand with me right now. If you want it, you can have it. Only believe. All you've got to do is believe. That's it. But because I believe, I'm going to do something about it. Because I believe what I've heard today, I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to make a choice. See, the most powerful thing God ever created was the human mind. He said, I won't even violate your will. I'll spin the galaxies in orbit. I'll make the tur this earth turn on its axis just perfectly for the seasons. I I'll make your heart beat. I'll breathe life into you. I I I'll orchestrate and turn everything, but I won't violate your will. God's given you authority and power to cross over the threshold into his kingdom further and further and further and there's nothing that can stop you whatever you think is stopping you cannot stop you whatever external circumstance or in your past or what somebody says or whatever it is in your body or whatever you're hooked on right now or wherever you think you're going or whatever you think you are i tell you there's nothing that's too hard for god this is not just for a, a, someone with a title pastor or somebody who who happens to pray a lot it's for all of us it's for all of us. It's for every one of you. God wants to do his work in your life. And there's already people right now saying, I've tried this before. I've tried. I'm, I'm giving up. You giving up is the only way it ends. You giving up is the only way you fail. You throwing in the towel is the only way you fail. That's why we can't stop praying for the prodigals. 
That's why you can't stop praying over your sickness. I know it. Hey, God, you haven't healed me yet. I'm knocking on the door again. God, I know you haven't provided yet. Guess what, God? Yep, it's me again. It's me again, God. Save my kid. God, it's me again. Heal my body. God, it's me again. Restore my soul. Uh, every hand raised. Every hand raised. God, let faith, I feel faith rising. It's welling up right now. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. You've hoped for it, but there's been no substance. Now it's time to put the substance to the hope. It's the evidence of the things you haven't seen yet. In the name of Jesus, Father, I pray over everyone in this house and everyone that's watching online. God, let there be a decision. God, I see somebody looking at the threshold right now. They know they can take the step, but they said, I've done this before. I've tried this before. It didn't happen last time. Yesterday is gone. Yesterday is gone. What happened before doesn't have to happen again. Make a decision today. Come on, do you have a need? Do you want to give your life to Jesus Christ? Do you want to reconsecrate? I say very kindly, it's not going to happen by you being passive, but it's going to happen because you understand he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Does anybody want to seek him this morning? If you do, I'm asking you to come to this front. I'm asking you to not let fear stop you. I'm, not, I'm asking you to not let shame stop you. Oh, everybody's going to watch me. No, they're not. They're wondering if you're watching them. Come on, these altars are open. There should be people flooding these altars right now. In the name of Jesus, as the pastors begin to minister. Come on, all it takes is a little bit of faith. Just like the grain of a mustard seed. Just a small seed. Come on, maybe you're like the man with the devil-possessed son. Lord, I believe, but you got to help my unbelief. I believe, but there's part of me that doesn't believe. Help my unbelief. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, let your will be done. God, I'm crossing over. I'm crossing over right now because I believe there's nothing too hard for you. There's nothing too hard for you. You spun the galaxies in orbit. You can heal my body. Lord, you, you uphold everything by the word of your power. Then you can bring these promises to pass. You can save me. You can heal me. You can restore me. You can make me a son and a daughter of God. Oh, Lord, let hope be restored. Let life be restored here today. Oh, come on, church, let's pray. Let's diligently seek him. Let's diligently seek him. Stop letting shame bind you. Stop letting condemnation bind you. Stop letting unworthiness hold you back. Nothing is too hard for God. Oh, I know it's been a long time. Oh, come on, there's somebody here. It's been too long. My chance is over. My chance is over. No, it's not in Jesus' name.